Maria Lahn. He, Imam Mursi, attended Madrasa from a very young age, and it is said that he memorized the entire Quran within one year. He continued to study other signs, and his teachers from a young age saw within Imam Mursi Ahmad a great future ahead of him. There was once a particular ancient that is narrated in the books of history that a man entered the madrasa and they saw him writing on a tablet, not the tablets of today, the tablets that they used to write back then. And this man that entered told Imam Mursi that it is not for a Sufi to blacken that which is white. Imam Mursi then responds, he says, Sir, it is not rather as you suggest, but it is for us that the heavenly scriptures should not be darkened by the darkness of our sins. Can you imagine a young boy at that time responding in a way like this? Can you imagine the amount of insight that they had from a young age. It goes on. He then, as a young person, understands the purpose of life, as we can see through this comment that he made, that it shouldn't be that our sins darken the heavenly scriptures. Yeah, it shouldn't be. It's so deep. If you should just ponder on it, he says rather that it shouldn't be that the heavenly scriptures get darkened by the darkness of our sins. So even for us to commit a sin, we should reflect on it because in contrary, as the, the Imam has said, it darkens the sins of, not the darkens the sins of the heavenly scriptures, but I think you know where I'm getting to. So he continues. Then after he starts working with his father as a trader, and it is said that he became an example to other traders because of his honesty, his trustworthiness, and he was a man that gave his word when he promised something. At a young age, he became an example to other elderly traders. Does this kind of remind you of something? Of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did they call him? Allah Amin, the trustworthy one. And if you read through the life of this Imam, you will see how much it reflects the lifestyle of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He continues, and it also said that with the profits that he earned, or his wages, or his salary, as we know it, that he earns from the trading, he would then go about and spend it on the poor. He continues trading till about at the age of 24. At the age of 24, his father then tells him that uh, we're going for Hajj, you know, the whole family. And they then, remember they're living in Spain, they then make their way by sea and on their way to go and perform Hajj. The boat gets overturned. The boat that him and his family was on gets overturned and many people on that boat drowned. This happens close to the shore of Tunisia. Imam Mursi and his brother then manages to swim to shore and they reach the shore of Tunisia and they then go and settle in a place, in a city in Tunisia called Tunis. At this time, can you imagine this is probably one of the greatest trials for somebody to go through. Number one, you have lost your family, your parents. Number two, he has lost all his wealth. They have lost their homes. And on top of it, they're now in a foreign land that they don't know. Imam Mursi's first thing that he tells his brother now is he needs to find somebody, a ship, that can guide him to Allah. He now needs to find a ship to guide him to Allah. This was his main concern. It shows us the beauty 
of, of, of the sheikh because can you imagine if something like that, may Allah protect us, should happen to us when we lose our family, we lose our possession, we lose our, our, our property, we lose our wealth, right? And we're in a foreign land. And the very first thing, one of the first things that he suggests is, and I need to now surround myself or find ulama that I can learn the deen of Islam with. He wasn't inclined to worldly attachments. What will our response be? Yo, what am I going to do now? How am I going to restart my business now? I think this is a moment for us to reflect that if anything, like I said, if Allah must protect us in our possessions and our families, but if anything should happen to your possessions or to my possessions, if my house should burn down, if I should lose my family, will I still be the person that I am? Like the beautiful saying goes, it doesn't matter what you have, but it matters, what matters is who you are. And through this words of Imam Mursi, you can kind of get an understanding of he had no attachments to this worldly life. His only attachment was Allah, because without Allah, we will be lost. And when he had nothing, the only thing that he was still seeking was Allah. And he was seeking for a guide and a teacher and a sheikh and a master in order for him to go ahead with his path. He then resides in Tunis, right? And Sheikh Shadli is also in a town close to Tunis called Shadila. Imam Shadli, let's just focus about Imam Mursi for a minute. Imam Shadli is originally from Morocco. He studied in Morocco from a young age and he, from a young age, he used to sit with the top ulama discussing things. And I'm speaking about top ulama, if you should go through some of these names, you will be amazed. And for somebody of that age to be sitting with such ulama at that time is already, wow, you know, little alone to understand what they are saying because the speech will be so much with what in depth of wisdom to understand what they are saying is something else, but to sit and have a discussion with them shows you the caliber of the intellect of Imam Shadli. Imam Shadli then studies in Morocco and he grows up in Morocco and then he has this, he's, he's, he has to make a choice. He thinks to himself, what is he going to do? Do we go into solitude and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? to reach a higher rank, or does he go out into the towns and call people to Allah? So he's stuck between, and he's, does he go out and, and seek the kutub of the time? So he, he has to make a choice. He then decides to go out and, 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 and seek the kutub of, of the time, and he goes to the east. He goes and he go and meets the sheikh, and the sheikh, he spends time with the sheikh, and the sheikh tells him that you have come so far to come and learn here when yet close to you there is a kutub as well. There is a great sheikh. And Imam Mursi asks, how will I find uh, not Mark, but Imam Mursi, Imam Shadli asks, how will I find him? The sheikh then tells Imam Shadli that when you go to your town, look for the light. And when you find the light, you follow the light and you will find the sheikh. Imam Shadli then makes his way back to Morocco. He then goes to Morocco and he sees the light. <laughs> he sees the light. You know, these people had great spiritual insight, Basira. He then goes and he sees this light on top of a mountain. And he makes his way up to the mountain and he sees at the foot of the mountain, there's like a spring. And he knows that if I'm going to go and meet the sheikh, it's best for me to go prepare. Let me take wudu here at the bottom of the, of, the, of the spring. And he takes his wudu and he comes up to the summit of the mountain and he sees the sheikh busy uh, 
um, listening to the recitation of the Quran from his son. No. And Imam Shadli waits till, the, till, he's finished, till his son is finished reciting. He then approaches the Sheikh and he greets the Sheikh. And the Sheikh asks him, uh, Did you perform wudu? And Imam Shadli says, Yes, he did. Because the Sheikh says, Because we only teach the ones that is pure. Yeah. And then Imam Shadli says, Yes. And then the Sheikh tells him, No, you haven't. Go take wudu again, and he makes his way back down the mountain, right? He goes back to the to the spring, and he goes and perform wudu again, and he comes up again, and the sheikh asks him again, my son, have you performed wudu? And he says, yes. And the sheikh, Mawlana um, Abdul Salam, tells him, no, go down and perform wudu again. And as Sheikh Ashadli goes down again, and as he goes down, he's thinking, what is the Sheikh trying to tell him, you know? Because he's performing wudu. And as he makes his way down to the spring again, he realizes that the Sheikh wants him to purify himself from all knowledge and all actions that he has previously done. And he then makes you do again, but he makes you do now with a different intention. He makes you do that, oh Allah, purify me from all my actions and knowledge that I have acquired before this. Remember, he was a well-learned man, boy at this time. He used to sit with the ulama in Morocco that was far older than him. And as he makes his way back up to the mountain, he meets the sheikh, he sees the sheikh coming down and the sheikh meets him halfway on the, on the mountain. The sheikh then tells him, oh my son, now you have performed the do. You know, when you come here to learn, I want you to come with an empty vessel. The sheikh then makes a parable. He says, if you come here, imagine you come here with a bucket filled with water, how much of the water can you enter into that bucket if the bucket is already full? He says, none. He says, yes. That's why I want you to purify yourself from everything that you have learned before this. Leave it at the bottom of the mountain. And this is how it starts. And then the Imam, Sheikh uh, Mawlana Abdul Salam, then tells him, then uh, he gives his lineage, the, 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 the conversation goes on, but then the Mawlana then tells Abdus, um, Imam Shadli, he's able to tell him his lineage right up until Rasulullah Sallallahu And Imam Shadli was amazed with us. I've never met the Sheikh before, you know? He would tell the, 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 the Sheikh for me, uh, his own lineage up to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because Imam uh, Shadili's father, if I, let me get this correct, well, I get confusing sometimes, but his mother and his father both was descendants from Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one from, the, from Imam Hussein and the other one from Imam Hassan. And the Sheikh is then able to tell him his own lineage and the, he spends some time with the sheikh, and once he sees a dream, right? No, just hold on. The first night, then they go up to the cave, and the first night they sleep inside. The sheikh sleeps inside the cave, and Imam Shadli sleeps outside the cave. And then they, uh, the morning he wakes up, and he greets the sheikh in the man Shadli, has a dream that evening, and he dreamt about I'm going blank now. We'll speak again about the dream, inshallah. The means of time travel will be dear by it. But inshallah, maybe by the next episode, along with Salih Muhammad, we will discuss about the, the, the dream of Ashadli and more about his life. But Sheikh Ashadli then spends time with uh, Maulana Abdul Salah in Morocco. From there, the Maulana then instructs him to go to Tunisia, right? I think that is why I went blank because this should have been now in a long discussion of Imam Shadli, where our actual discussion is about Imam Mursi, 
inshallah and Allah forgive us and forgive me. So then, Yishev then instructs him to go to Tunisia to call people to Islam. He makes his way to Tunisia and he then has a huge following. The Qadi, the ruler of the time in Tunisia that time, didn't like the idea and he was envious of Imam Ashadi. He then uh, speaks to he then uh, speaks to the Sultan or the of that time, the Khalifa of that time, and then they make false accusations against Imam Shadi, which we're not going to get in now. Just to cut the long story short, Imam Shadi then decides to leave Tunisia because of all the envy and the political pressure that was happening in Tunisia. He then makes his way to Egypt. The Qadi of Tunisia then sends a letter to Egypt telling them of Imam Shadi that's coming there and what he is going to do and what he has done there is pretty a lot of fake news, basically, the bottom line. He arrives in Alexandria, he speaks to the sheikh of, uh, to the ruler of, of, of Alexandria at the time, and the ruler then see, but this God he was speaking a lot of nonsense. Imam Shahli then resides in Alexandria. So the thing of Imam Shahli was that he used to perform Hajj every second year. He then went and he went going to perform Hajj. On his way back from Hajj, he just received some inspiration that he needs to go back to Tunis, to Tunisia, right? He don't know why. He remember he suffered so much under the political rule of Tunisia. So then, he, but he gets his inspiration, he needs to go back and he tells uh, his followers we're in to Tunisia. They go to Tunisia, they reside in Tunisia. Now, the time that Imam Mursi gets to Tunisia, Imam Shadli is residing in the town called Shadla. Imam Mursi, what was his first statement? He remains about no fact. He needs to find somebody that he can attach himself to, a guide, a spiritual guide, a sheikh, right? He speaks to another man. The man tells him there is a, a, a guy close by, an imam close by, and he's a, a well-known sheikh. He can introduce him to, to Imam Mursi, you know? He can take Imam Mursi to him and they can go sit in his gatherings. Imam Mursi tells him, just hold on, let me first make istikhara of it. He then go and sleep that night, Imam Mursi. Imam Mursi then dreams that night that he goes on top of a mountain. And when he reaches the top of the mountain, he sees three men sitting on a bench. The one sitting in the middle has a green cloak on, and there's one to the right and one to the left. And he approaches the three men in his dream, and the one man sitting in the middle tells him, you have now found the kutub of the time, the khalifa of the time, of the age. And he wakes up, you know, because this is what he was searching for. And he wakes up and it's almost time for Fajr and he prepares him for Fajr and he makes his Fajr Salah. And then that same man comes again and tells him, listen, there's this man, the, the chef that I told you about, he's having a, a Khalka. I can take you to him. He says, okay, let's go. He goes and they then approach the Khalka. So then they, when they come to the Khalka, of Imam Shadli. Imam Shadli sees Imam Mursi and Imam Mursi sees Sheikh Shadli. And the very first thing that Imam Mursi notices is the bench that he saw in his dream the night before is the very same bench that Imam Shadli is sitting on. And Imam Shadli then, Imam Mursi approaches Imam Shadli in order to speak to him and give him salat. Imam Shadli then tells him, you have now found the kutub of the time of this age. And from the, that moment, Imam Shad, Imam Mursi was like, wow, you know, this was divinely inspired. This is Nueva. This was divinely inspired, right? Imam Mursi, then Imam, Imam Shadli then tells 
Ima Mursi that nothing has brought me to Tunisia except that I had to meet you. Remember when he was on his way to Hajj? He just got the inspiration that he needed to come to Tunisia. So Imam Mursi, Imam Shadi then tells Imam Mursi that nothing has inspired me to come back to Tunisia besides the fact that I had to meet you. And this is how their journey began. And this is now where the journey of a love story happens because Imam Mursi then does not leave the side of Imam Shadli until the end of the life of Imam Shadli. They then make their way, they spend time together in Tunisia, they then make their way to um, Alexandria, back to Egypt, to Alexandria. And on their way, uh, when they arrive in Alexandria, it is said that they were extremely hungry because of the long travels, right? And at that time that we travel by boat, there wasn't the luxury that we sometimes have by flying and by driving in luxury air conditioning buses. So then they were very hungry. The residents of Alexandria then brought them food. And then Imam Shadi then instructs them, do not eat of the food, right? And they are all shocked, but they wouldn't question the shit. You know, okay, was is longer, but okay, the chef if the series multi it is, so was kind of it, right? They then overnight, and during the night, Imam Shadi then has a dream, and the morning he explains to them why he instructed them not to eat, because he never knew the source of the food, whether it was permissible or not. He then has a dream to say that it is okay for them to eat because of the courtesy of the guests and because of the long travels and the condition that they are in. They then partake in the food in the morning. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Really, when you speak about these great giants of Islam, there's so much to speak about. You can speak about their life, you can speak about their character, you can speak about how they used to treat the people, and I can guarantee you there's many people that have spoken and written volumes on their lives and gave commentaries on the, on, the, on the books that was written about them. Our focus today is just to try and understand how they came to Egypt, how they came to Egypt. So that was one of the ways, not one of the ways, that was the way how they arrived in Egypt. The beautiful masjid of Imam Mursi that we go and visit. Imam Mursi then, like I said, is under the servitude of his master and his chef and his spiritual guide, Imam Shaduli, till the end of his life where he then becomes the successor and then he becomes the second inheritor of the Shaduli Tarika. Some of the stuff that stands out for me about the life of Imam Mursi while living with Imam Shadli because all the time Imam Mursi was, Imam Shadli was training Imam Mursi to become his successor. So there was this one particular time when um, Imam Mursi comes to Sheikh Shadli and Imam Shadli instructs him, imagine this, he instructs him not to ask anything of anyone for the entire year. Not to ask anything of anyone for the entire year. He says that he completed it by not asking anyone for anything. After that, the sheikh comes with another commandment. Imam Shadli then tells him, now I do not want you to take anything from anyone for another year. Ya yes, Salam. <laughs> can you imagine that? You spend, can you imagine, you're spending your life where you do not take anything from anyone. He says he continued this for another year, but this was extremely difficult because how don't you take anything from anyone? He says sometimes he used to get so hungry that he used to go to the shores of Alexandria. As you know, Alexandria is a coastal city in Egypt. 
He used to go to the shores of Alexandria and he then used to go and see for the leftovers, to leftover food to eat that the people had thrown off on the ship. He came once and he got another guy doing the same thing. And he asked this guy, are you under the same command? And he says, yes. And this guy tells him, I saw a dream of your ship. I saw a dream of your ship. And then Imam Mursi, he tells the dream to Imam Mursi. Long story short, he then tells Imam Mursi he saw a dream where he saw Imam Shadili in his dream close to the arch of Allah. Close to the arch of Allah. Imam Mursi then responded that the only reason why you saw the shaykh is because the shaykh descended so that you could see him. This is to bring, I think, about the attention of the spiritual light that this great shaykh, Imam Shadili, reached. Today we have followers of this path, of this tariqah throughout the world, throughout the world. And the very second busy editor was Imam Mursi Abbas. They show him the time here, because we still have a few other stops to go, but we can continue and speaking about this ship and his life and the things that he done and how much the people loved him. And one of the things that Imam, let's go back quickly to when Imam Shadli is at the mountain with the ship, Mawlana Abu Salam, right? He tells him that when you call people to the way, right? Don't call them to action because the action will tire them. Rather call them to Allah so that they may find contentment. Rather call them to Allah so that they can find contentment. And this become imminent in the life of Abu Mursi. Uh, yeah, Abu Mursi because like, for instance, if I was a bricklayer, or I was a carpenter, for me to become a student, it wasn't required of me to forsake my profession and strip and, and completely go into the Sufi path. But it was for me to continue being a, a carpenter or bricklayer in my profession and yet just uphold the the, the pathway that they all hold on to Allah and to his Rasul. And this was the balance that Imam Shadi offered. And that's why, and the, that Imam Mursi offered. And that's why people flocked to them. And one of the students of Imam uh, Mursi was Ibn, Imam Ibn Atayillah. He then, he's Imam Shadli and Imam Mursi didn't write any books. He said his day, Murid was uh, like a testament of their life, right? They didn't write. Imam Atayla, he was the one of the first of the uh, Shadi Tariqa that came and came to come and write books. And one of his books up to today is like the manual, the manual for the Sufi order, and he was one of the students of Imam Abu Mursi Ibn Abbas. I think I'm going to stop at there because we still need to go to the student of Imam Mursi, which is Imam Busayri, inshallah. But I think for now, I'll cross over to Zubayr for a moment, inshallah. Uh, yes, Ibrahim, your, your time is indeed. Uh, <laughs> You actually took a lot of a big chunk of my uh, of my part, but I won't complain about that. Um, just uh, away from the the bit of the history, um, just on on Alexandria itself. Obviously, for those that have been, um, we do know it's a popular tourist destination. Um, the, the highlights of of the city would be the Fierce Lighthouse, and of course, um, famous would be the the library so the library just a bit of history there the library the library um uh back in 
It was actually the seven wonders, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the largest library at the time in the world. And um, it was burnt by accident by uh, a, a fellow called so called Julius Caesar. It was a long, long time ago. And they actually, a few years ago, we were on travel and uh, there was construction. And alhamdulillah, now there, is the, there was construction on the library, on the new library. And I believe it is open. So inshallah, Ibrahim, on our next journey to Alexandria, we will take our way to visit the library because they have museums inside the, the, the library as well. And it boasts to well, hold something like 8 million books. And I'm sure Imam Lucy and uh, Imam Musayri and the rest of the giants of Islam will visit the digital library. Hey, Wormy, I just said now that you've ever been in books. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the people that write books on oh, them, on yes, them, that's yeah. what I mean. I'm actually and speaking all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the so cool giants of Islam. Um, but uh, that would be the um, one of the highlights um, on 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 Alexandria. I don't know what to Inshallah, so now we make our way to Imam Busayri. Imam Busayri was a student, as I mentioned, of Imam Mursi. Imam Busayri was born in Egypt. Not much is known about his lineage. His actual name is Muhammad. Not, like I said, Mark, not much is known about his life, but a lot is written of his works. He was a poor man married with kids. The most important thing was he was a poet and he was very intelligent. He would write poetry in praise of people and of kings. And like that, he used to get paid. So, on a particular time, I'm trying to make the story short now because of time constraint. Um, he then once enters the place and he reads a poem to people about kings and praising people. And then there is a man sitting and when he was done, the man asked him, Oh, uh, Busayri, tell me, did you dream of the Prophet last night, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And he looks at the man amazed because this is not an ordinary question to ask, you know, if you're done with a job, for instance, that is like one of the last things that somebody is going to ask you. So it's, it's a very unusual question. And when Busayri tells him, No, he leaves them. But this stuck in his mind and it affected him deeply. And he, like I said, he was a very intelligent man. Today, he's still going and I don't know, and different by demand for him, right? And that very same night, he dreams of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After this, it kind of changes his whole direction of life because now, he switches from writing praises of kings and people and places. Instead, he would then write religious poetry in praise of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, and about Islam. But this then does make that he doesn't get a lot of work, right? And he was already poor, so now he becomes poorer. And a lot of people write that this could have possibly led to him getting a stroke because he gets a stroke. And because of this stroke, he becomes paralyzed. And he himself says he could barely sit up straight for a long period of time, how the stroke affected him. He then thinks to himself that he wants to write this one special poem because he's thinking he's leading to the end of his life now. And he's thinking he wants to write this one special poem, you know, and he starts writing and he starts writing. And this one night while he's writing the poem and reading the poem to himself, he then falls asleep. And in his dream, he sees Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu coming to him and putting a cloak, rubbing his hands over his body and putting a green cloak over him. When Imam Busayri wakes up in the morning, he finds that he was healed from his, what's the word, paralysis. He was healed, he was healed, right? 
Om die te te sê, right? And this to his amazement, you know, he was, wow, you know? And he remembered the, the dream of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He then rushes off to the market, you know? Because he's, he's filled with ecstasy, you know? He's cured. And as he comes to the marketplace, he sees this other dervish man, and this dervish man asks him, can you read me the poem? And Imam Busayri asks him, which poem are you referring to? Because he wrote many poems on Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, no, that, that poem, you know. And Imam Busayri asks him, which poem are you speaking about? And he says, the poem that you read to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam last night in your dream. And this is how we came to know about it because this will probably remain a secret, right? And Imam, Imam Busayri then reads the poem to, to, to uh, this dervish man and the news spread. And this poem is being read until today and it is world are you renowned. Gonna, are you going to sing the poem for you? If I had a voice, I would have done it. If I had a voice, I would have done it. But this poem then gets known as Qasida Burda. As many of you know, Muhammad Maula Ya Salli Wa Sallim. I'm not going to continue further because I already see people leaving the Zoom. <laughs> but this Qasida Burda represents love. Love for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The love that Imam Busayri had for Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as you know, it is stated in the books of Hadith, if you see a dream of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, know that it is him that came to you because Shaitan cannot imitate or replicate Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream. So may Allah guide us and protect us and make us have beautiful dreams of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inshallah, because it will be as if he has come to you because Shaitan cannot replicate him. Um, where are we? We, we, are, we, 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 we still carrying on? No, we still need to get to Nuwaib. Yes, exactly. And I think we need to move along because we, we have to go on to Nuwaib. We have a lot to talk about still. So before, before we go to Nuwaib, let's, another cover that is in, in Alexandria, uh, is the cover of Abu Darda, Rajala and Sahabi. Um, just to mention something small about uh, Abu, da Abu Darda, inshallah. It is said that once a man came to Abu Darda to visit him by his house. On reaching there, the friend noticed that the Mansa is and by a claim, you know, that if you would to stand full length in, in, in the house of Abu Darda, it will be shorter than your full height. And it was narrow, and the house of utilities was less than the basic. The guy then asked Abu Darda, why do you live in such conditions? You know? Abu Darda didn't tell him, don't worry. Uh, he is busy, this is just temporary. He is busy building the house that he desires, you know. The man says, okay, it's understandable. The man then comes back after a while and then the man uh, sees, but this is not exactly the same house and you're still living in the same condition, you know. And the man asks Abu Darda again, so I thought this was a temporary uh, house for you constructing the house that you desire and then Abu Darda tells him the house that I was referring to was my cover was my grave the house that I was referring to was my cover and was my grave this give us this is so beautiful for me because when you stand at the cover of Abu Darda you will find it's a small holding in the middle of a road in the middle of the road, and once there was one traveler that traveled with us and said, but no, who can learn the cover mark and the murder of path, you know? <laughs> and then the response was that the cover was there before the road. And when you stand at the cover of Abu Dhabi and you think that his whole life, he was preparing for this time, 
you know, for the year after. And he didn't also have much attachment in the worldly life. Let's get back to the attachments in the worldly life. Uh, do I have time? Let, let me just divert for a minute, right? We're going to get to Makkah, but let me just share this, inshallah. Nabi Muhammad, it is reported that the one dua that Nabi Muhammad sallallahu made, right, while he was making tawah, that is confirmed is, oh Allah, grant me good in this world, grant me good in the year after, save me from the fire of Jahannam and enter me into Jannah. So if this was the only confirmed dua that we had, that Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa made while he made tawah. When we speak about good, what do we think good is? Osmuna Lika, he said, we must have a nice, decent car, our house must be furnished well, our children must have a good education. We would consider that as a good life. Looking at the life of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do we really think that that was his intention when he asked for good in this world? When yet we live, we know that he lived in minimum conditions, we know that he had minimum provisions in his house. So what was the good of this world to Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I think the good of this world to Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was you and I, the people of this world. So then you ask the question now, how does the people of this world become the good of this world? It is when you do good to someone else, when you instill hope into someone else, when you do good to them, when they help them in a time of difficulty, when you teach them a trade, when you teach them Quran, and then they make action on that which you taught them. And the day that you are no longer in the dunya, you win the akhirah, and they continue to act upon the good that you have inspired them with, that then in turn become good for you while you in the year after. Abu Darda understood this. That's why he didn't make preparations to build him an extravagant, extravagant house. I'm not saying there's anything good with it, but he wasn't attached to it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having luxury cars, but he wasn't attached to it. His main focus was the year after. Abu Darda also says beautifully, he says that none of you can be pious unless he is knowledgeable. And, and he cannot enjoy knowledge unless he applies it practically. None of you can be claimed to be pious unless he is knowledgeable. And he cannot enjoy that knowledge unless he applies it practically. You don't need to know a lot. It's good to know a lot, but even if you know a little, make action upon that which you know, inshallah. 